go for it! It's me, your buddy Dave, the host here at the Dark Stuff channel on YouTube. Thanks a lot for uh, stopping by, tuning in, whatever the expression of the moment is. Um, it is much appreciated. You just saw a little clip of Japanese Breakfast. I just saw the band a couple nights ago here in Omaha at the place called The Slowdown. The show was awesome. It absolutely exceeded expectations, which is rare in this day and age. But I want to talk about that, plus another a show that I saw. And then, um, uh, but before I get to that, I want to talk about the uh, 30th anniversary of an album that is really, really, really uh, important to me and in my world, and definitely one of the most important records of the entire uh, 90s. You might be able to hear it playing in the background, but I am talking about Sonic Youth Dirty. This is my, by the way, original pressing, 1992 DGC, which at the time came with a bonus track here called Stalker. They put it in brown ink to emphasize that it was only on the vinyl and stuff. Um, but it was a double album inside a single sleeve. It's got these uh, picture sleeves with kind of imagery from the album. And then here's one of them with the band and the credits. It's black vinyl. It's kind of hard to overstate the significance of the album Dirty uh, to me. And it's not even my favorite Sonic Youth album, nor my favorite Sonic Youth album of the 90s, but still, they were so good in that decade that it's kind of, it's, I don't want to keep using that expression, hard to overstate. It, it's, it is hard to overstate. I don't know, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm at a loss for words in terms of coming up with a good uh, uh, expression there. So I would gotten into Sonic Youth in 1990 or so, uh, I think. I was 19, and I, the Goo album had come out, and I had heard Daydream Nation, and I'd seen Sonic Youth on MTV. Um, well, there was 120 minutes, but there used to be shows pre-120 minutes. Like, there was the IRS is the cutting edge, and there was, like, postmodern MTV and stuff like that. So I had seen Sonic Youth on TV a couple of times. I was definitely aware of who they were, but I couldn't say I was a fan until 1990, and I saw them for the first time on that tour for Goo as the opening act for Neil Young, okay? And it was Neil Young and Social Distortion and Sonic Youth, it was cool in a lot of ways, and it was kind of weird in a lot of ways. It was cool in that here I am, Sonic Youth, in this awesome place, and Neil Young's so cool, he's putting them on the bill and all this, but Neil Young did have an older crowd even back then in 1990 and 91, and the crowd was kind of not that into Sonic Youth, if I'm just being honest, you know. So if I remember, it was like the Ragged Glory Tour, and then he did the album Weld after that. So Neil Young was in a bit of a rocking, noisy phase too, but I think that... You know, some of the, the crowd, the older crowd, uh, was kind of expecting some 70s kind of lighter stuff, and that wasn't on the agenda. So anyways, we'll not talk about that show, but that was my introduction to Sonic Youth. They became one of the most important bands of the entire decade for me, without question. People who know me more from the radio and not really from uh, this channel would think that Sonic Youth is probably my favorite band because on my radio show, New Day Rising, I close every single show with a Sonic Youth song. Every single one, without exception. So Dirty was their second major label album, their first post-Nirvana album, which is when the whole landscape of the world changed. Although, you know, it was changing a little bit before Nirvana. Nirvana was the, quote, game changer, and it shifted a whole hell of a lot. But the ground had been moving for a few years, and Sonic Youth was definitely one of those bands that was helping uh, move that ground. 
I just even on their you know major label debut, they felt I felt like they were just too noisy and abrasive, and sometimes the lyrics dealt with topics that made you know kind of white older record executives kind of uncomfortable, and then maybe it was just never going to really happen for them. But Sonic Youth did decide to go with a producer, uh, the same production and mixing team that did Nirvana Nevermind. So they used Butch Vig as the producer engineer, and then they used Andy Wallace to mix the album. But it is not any type of attempt to sound like Nirvana, any type of clone, any type of... Um, softing or you know mellowing of Sonic Youth it's a very noisy and it sounds just like Sonic Youth Butch Vig was brought in and his pitch to the band was he would tighten their musical arrangements a little bit because he thought they meandered a bit fair point he wanted to tighten the arrangements a little bit and he wanted to really really work on their guitar sounds for Thurston and Lee and that was the pitch that they wanted that's what they got the album does sound phenomenal and it's a Sonic Youth album it's no way sort of a compromise or different or anything. That's why it's still considered such a classic. So there were a couple of singles from this album. I have all the CD singles, but you know, to make room back there, I had to clear some stuff out and I cleared out every CD single, boxed them up and put them in another room. So unfortunately I didn't, couldn't grab you to show them, but on the album they did have 100% was a single, uh, Sugar Cane was a single, and so was Youth Against Fascism, which was a, a, a political song. Ian Mackay plays guitar on it from Fugazi, by the way, plays guitar on it. It's a really political song. It's kind of attacking the American president at the time, George H.W. Bush, and calling him a fascist and all of this. And wow, it, it seems almost like quaint to have been mad about George H.W. Bush back then, considering that we had Donald Trump and how much worse he was. I mean, I'd take George H.W. Bush as president for life if we never had to have Donald Trump. But anyways, that's a side note. So that's kind of a more political song. Excellent, excellent tune. Um, the album does deliver on, on what was promised in terms of Butch Vig, and that was he tightened the arrangements. There's no 10-minute songs. There's no, you know, just the... The jamming was kind of kept to a minimum. There's some for Sonic Youth fans that are into that. But it was uh, tightened up. And I, I gotta think, like, you know, I, probably DGC Records thought that 100% was going to be um, a hit, maybe, okay? And it is a catchy song. It's two and a half minutes. It's great. Kim Gordon's wearing that t-shirt, the Stones, with the Stones logo, and it says, Eat Me, but they, <laughs> MTV made them block it off, so it just says, Eat M. So dumb. Anyways, eh, the 90s, gosh, uh, the, the, the morals back then. So anyways, um, it, it's a great, it's a fantastic record. The production is is exquisite. The playing is great. The songs are top notch. Sonic Youth hitting it on all cylinders. Like I said, it's not even my favorite Sonic Youth album. That would be Washing Machine, which comes after this one in 1995. But um, this was they were on such a roll. Okay, with Sister and Daydream Nation, and then Into Goo, and now Dirty. And I mean, it's just like man, this band was so on fire. So I have seen a couple of shows recently, not too many, not too many, but I've seen a few. And um, I showed you that clip of Japanese Breakfast. That was the, the, the main thing that I saw. I was just like, wow. Um, her album, Jubilee, which I have here, was my number two album of 2021. So obviously I was going into it really liking her. What I didn't realize, and I feel like a fucking idiot for this, is that I have had her previous album one of the previous albums, Soft Sounds from Another Planet, sitting back in that bin since 2017, and I never listened to it. For some reason, when this came in, I took a look at it and was like, well, it's Dead Oceans, I'm gonna keep it, but I never listened to it, and I feel like such a fucking idiot because now that I did listen to it, this album is maybe even better than Jubilee. I mean, I can't even believe what a fucking dummy I was. I can't play. Is 
So the woman behind Japanese Breakfast, Michelle Zahner, is having a moment now for sure. Uh, she's playing at all the big festivals. This was actually an off night from festivals because when she walked up on stage, she was like, wow, you guys are like so close, you know, because it was a club gig after playing these super far away festivals. So the show was fun. Her energy was just, you know, infectious. She's jumping up and down doing her kind of nerdy dances or whatever. Uh, she's sometimes just the singer. She plays guitar. She plays keyboards. Uh, it was great. So then there's a there's a new venue in Omaha. It's a new name for an old venue. It's, it's called the Admiral. I'm wearing a t-shirt here. Okay, for it. it. It used to be called Sokol Auditorium. It's over on 13th Street in Omaha. And over the past two years, it's been converted into a new place called the Admiral. So it finally opened at the beginning of July with a two-night stand from Bright Eyes. And, uh, you know, awesome. It, Bright Eyes was ending the tour with a two-night home, you know, hometown stand because Connor and most of the band are from Omaha. Um, I was working at the box office for uh, this particular show, which means I was up in the front. You know, when you come in, you have to go the, up these stairs, and then you would buy a ticket for me if you wanted uh, to buy a ticket. If you already had one, you would be on the other side, and you would go in and scan your ticket, and they'd take you in. Now, the first night of the show was sold out, so I had very little uh, I, I didn't sell any tickets, you know, but it was just people on the guest list, and and uh, the band had a had a pretty healthy guest list, so it was just dealing with that. It was pretty easy, but my entire vantage point was, you know, looking like this kind of. You know, it was like I was in this little prison, you know. Um, I should say, I, I want to point out that Hooray for the Riff Raff, the opener, uh, was fantastic both nights. I watched their sound check, I watched them perform both nights, and they sounded great. I couldn't see them that well from where I was, but they sounded excellent. The words I took my time, uh, another I'm not sure I can hang with this. Bright Eyes, same deal. I mean, I've seen Bright Eyes 10, 15 times over the years. Um, so I couldn't really, I didn't really see much of the show because I was in my little booth. And the second night, uh, we sold lots of tickets because it had didn't wasn't actually full or it didn't actually sell out in advance. So there were still plenty of tickets that people could buy. So the box office was a little bit more active. But I did get to, uh, we closed up the box office at some point. It was like, okay, no more, no more tickets. And I did go in and watch the show for a little bit. So my one little clip is from me on the side. Uh, All right, just wanted to pop in real quick. I uh, hope you dug any of that and got something out of it. If While you're waiting here, now that the video's over, go ahead, throw on uh, Sonic Youth Dirty. All right, talk to you later. Bye.